Thank you for joining in this uh, webinar, which is focused on cardiac CT and cardiac MRI role in day-to-day -day practice. Then we're going to go on to capabilities of cardiac CT and especially for assessment of coronary artery disease. We are not going to be looking at congenital heart disease in any detail. Also, we'll talk about its utility in day-to-day -day practice. And in the end, we'll discuss about some of the practical aspects of cardiac CT. When it comes to cardiac CT, you're talking about coronary calcium score is one entity. The other entity is coronary CT angiography and aspects of extra coronary analysis also come in. Now, coronary calcium score is something very, very exciting and something very, very useful, which uh, I would advise a lot of us to start using because it is a simple non-contrast CT. It takes less than two minutes to perform. And essentially, what we are looking at is atherosclerotic changes in the coronary artery disease, which can be seen in form of these calcification. What is clearly shown is that even earlier detection of calcified plaques can be seen before there is any stenosis or people start to have disease where they start presenting. Now, in India, we are prone for coronary artery disease and in our experience, what is happening is young patients who have no diabetes, no hypertension, but a strong family history at the age of 35 to 40 start to have coronary atherosclerosis. Now, if you look at the calcium score and look at the 10-year heart risk, you can see that the Agatston score gives you a decent estimate of likelihood of developing coronary artery disease. But most of these data are Caucasian-based data. There is very little or no data available for the Indian population. Now, if you apply, if you apply the coronary artery calcium score to your standard risk factors, such as Framingham risk factor, what they have shown is that there is significant potential intensification of treatment. What that basically means is if you get a patient and you have a patient with intermediate risk and you want to advise them on some specific therapy or some specific regime of activity, physical activity, these patients are more likely to follow this if you tell them that you already have a calcified plaque in your coronary artery disease. There is a disease which is already done. Now with the MESA trial, when we reclassified patients based on calcium score, at least 25% of the times people were reclassified between intermediate to risk groups. So simple standard risk factification of uh, you know, taking history based on their uh, smoking history or cholesterol levels is not sufficient and calcium score gives much more superior results to that. Now, if you look at the asymptomatic, if asymptomatic patients undergo calcium score, there is a 97% of negative predictive value, with future maze being very low. So these are much better than conventional risk factors that we use. If, however, the patient is symptomatic, and the calcium score is less than 100, then less than 2% of these nuclear medicine studies came positive in them, or less than 3% of cat and Joshua severe disease. So this is the take, what I feel about calcium score, okay? All the data is mostly Caucasian, and we really do not have enough data. I believe it's a great tool for mass screening. However, for individual patients, let's say a patient comes in and you do a calcium score and it is zero and the patient, you tell them 97% you do not have significant coronary artery disease. But the patient doesn't know if he's in the 97% or whether he's in the 3% that who would have. Our experience in asymptomatic patients has been extremely good. In symptomatic patients, we would not use it in isolation. We started a health screening drive and we offer it at a very, very cheap price uh, of doing calcium score for patients 
And uh, we are finding a lot of youngsters who have coronary artery atherosclerosis. They may not have significant occlusive disease, but they do have atherosclerosis. So they get started on active therapy and modify their lifestyle much more aggressively than otherwise. My personal feeling uh, about TMT, we are seeing a lot of patients who are false positive and false negative in treadmill test. And we are currently uh, in a dilemma whether we can replace our treadmill test with calcium score as an assessment. One practical point, calcium score is not used in patients who already have a stent or who've had a bypass grafting done before. Coronary CT angiography, well, the Scott Hart trial uh, came out and uh, gave a very, very good uh, evidence to support coronary CT use. The sensitivity is high of 94 to 95% with a negative predictive value of 99%. So what it means is if a CT says there is no coronary artery disease, then it is very, very clear that there is no coronary artery disease. However, if a CT says there is, let's say, 40% stenosis or 60% stenosis, the accuracy of stenosis grading is a bit variable, which is where the specificity becomes a problem. That even then, an 82% specificity is very, very good. When we look at various guidelines, who should have a coronary CT angiography rather than the traditional catheter angiography? Stable patients with suspected coronary artery disease, patients who present with acute chest pain in an end STEMI category, and you don't think they are in the high risk, they should have CT. Pre-op evaluation for non-cardiac surgeries. So this is something which has become a routine for us. For example, a 40-year-old going for a renal transplant or going for an aortic valve regurgitation, when they come for a cardiac clearance, we do CT angiography for these patients. Coronary artery bypass grafts or somebody who's had an angioplasty follow-up of these patients. Post-transplant, if you're looking for coronary artery diseases. And the question mark is about asymptomatic high-risk patients. Well, this does not come in any guidelines, but uh, this is something which we have started adopting in our practice. And we find it has a significant value in both uh, detecting coronary artery disease as well as calming down people that they do not have significant coronary artery disease so they can go about their life easily. Stents, uh, if the stents are more than three millimeter internal diameter, then CT is very good. Anything less than that, CT is not good. We may not be able to give you good uh, representation of the stenosis. Bypass grafts, CT is excellent. You know, it's so easy. You don't have to go fishing for each of the graft and injecting them every time in cath angio. CT will be able to see the grafts very nicely. So these are some of the graphs that we can see. We can see the anastomotic points. We can see the distal vessel as well. We can also see stumps of grafts which are occluded with a very high sensitivity and specificity. Acute chest pain, especially in end STEMI, what we have seen a lot of patients end up having uh, non-coronary abnormalities. So we have started uh, providing this service over the last 10 years called as a double rule out, whereby if you have coronary artery disease versus aortic dissection as your dilemma. So we look at both of these pathologies. If you're also interested in excluding pulmonary embolism, then we do a triple rule out uh, that is also included in there. This has been shown to be helpful in saving the cost for the patient and also helping in early discharge in the setup. Asymptomatic patients, should we do coronary angiography? So we've seen one, uh, a lot of patients who have a zero calcium score uh, and uh, we end up doing uh, coronary angiogram and about 3% of them do have uh, coronary artery disease, which is more than 50%. But any asymptomatic high-risk patients or patients who are worried about what's happening, we do offer coronary angiography for them. Again, good friends, car radiologists, cardiologists, surgeons of any specialities who get worried of atypical chest pain and they want us to do 
look at the coronary arteries. It is a five minute test and it is excellent and we do do this for them as well. What about plaque characterization? CT is good at differentiating vulnerable plaques. Newer advances are being made whereby we look at spectral CT where we are able to tell whether this is a lipid rich plaque or whether this is a fibrotic plaque. This is still not 100%. We are working on it. Uh, more and more technology is coming in this field, which will also change. People ask me about radiation exposure. If you've got a high end CT scanner, if you have got a uh, good heart rate, the radiation burden is negligible. 0.3 millisievert, whereas a, you know, a standard uh, catheter angiography is in the range of seven to 10 millisievert that one may be exposing themselves to. I'm not saying this is what happens in every case. You need to have a high-end scanner. You need to have low heart rate to be able to achieve these radiation doses. Let's look at some of these cases where CT is extremely useful. This is a patient who's got an anomalous origin of the right coronary artery from the left cusp. You can see it's got an interarterial course which can be nicely traced in these patients. So you can see this is the left main and this is the right coronary artery. It arises and courses between the iota and the pulmonary artery. A different patient, this is a patient who you can see the coronary arteries are grossly dilated and there is a fistulous communication between the coronaries and the pulmonary artery. So this is also something which can be very nicely depicted on CT examination in patients. This is a very unusual case. This is a patient who's got a iotopulmonary window and you can see this is the iota, this is the pulmonary artery and the left main stem is actually arising from the iotopulmonary window in this patient while the right coronary artery is arising so high from the iotic annulus and has got an interarterial course. Uh, Incidentally, we also come across pathologies like scimitar syndrome. Uh, you can see this is a partial anomalous pulmonary venous drainage going down to the liver in this patient. Coronary artery aneurysms, it's something very good uh, in seeing in the uh, CT. This again, uh, you can follow these patients up and look at them. This patient had a coronary fistula going into the right ventricle. Again, excellent for surgical planning or interventional planning in these patients. CT perfusion, which is something being worked at and looked at. A lot of institutes are using this. You do need specific high-end scanners to be able to see areas of perfusion defects. So you can see the OM vessel has got disease in this patient. And then you can see the perfusion defect in the OM vascular territory also in the same setting. Incidental coronary uh, congenital heart disease. This is a patient who's got in uh, superior sinus venosis ASD, where you can see there is anomalous pulmonary venous drainage of the right upper lobe veins into the SVC with the ASD in this patient who underwent a coronary CT angiography. Specifically looking at coronary arteries, this is a patient who's got a diffusely diseased RCA and there are areas of dissection that we could see in the vessel and this patient underwent a catheter angiography and a stent procedure for the same. Another patient, non-coronary applications who's had a aortic valve replacement and you could see there is a paravalvular leak, which was very useful in surgical planning and this patient underwent intervention, uh, image guided intervention. And you can see, this is the initial one where you can see the paravalvular leak along the valve here. And post procedure, the plug which has been put in this patient and you can see the leak has been sealed in there. So nicely you can see the leak being sealed. Another application, this is a patient who uh, underwent a uh, stenting procedure uh, for a iatrogenic induced uh, vessel injury in the subclavian artery. You can see the aneurysm and then post stenting, you can see that this has been very well covered. And there is no further leak in there. 
This was a patient who had come in uh, late presentation of acute myocardial infarction. And what you can see is this has got a VSD, post-infarct VSD. Again, uh, cardiac MR, uh, point, uh, cardiac CT pointed this out. Cardiac MR was done and we could clearly see this defect and the patient was taken up for surgery. Iotic interventions. CT is excellent in looking for them, not only for dissections, but also aneurysms to plan which way is the best way to proceed, whether intervention or whether surgical corrections need to be done. These are patients with uh, aortic intramural hematoma, aortic dissection, where you can see the intramural hematoma, and you can also see the true and the false lumen and clearly analyze which vessels are being supplied. So this was one of the double rule out patients for us. And we could clearly see that this was non-coronary artery disease and this was a aortic pathology. TAVI assessment is a separate topic and CT is excellent in looking at the aorta, the aortic valve planning, and it is very, very important as part of TAVI planning in there. Pericardial pathologies. Now, we did talk about the pericardium in cardiac MR, and we did say that restrictive versus constrictive physiology is very well differentiated in uh, cardiac MR, but CT is also excellent in demonstrating areas of pericardial calcification or pericardial effusion when you want to look at acute inflammatory or chronic constrictive pericarditis features. So, in summary, CT is highly accurate in assessment of uh, coronary artery disease, bypass graft, and stents. It is a great tool for screening, especially for non-cardiac surgery fitness cases. Calcium score in asymptomatic patients is excellent and we should use it. <coughs> Atypical presentation of chest pain, one should use double and triple rule out with CT. And there is extensive role in non-coronary applications looking at the iota and the other blood vessels. Let's talk about some of the practical aspects. Now, when it comes to CT, whether you have a 64 slice machine or a 320 slice machine, it does make a difference. Higher the slice, higher the faster rotation time, the CT scanners are better. Renal function has to be good for contrast. Heart rate has to be controlled to get the better images. So somebody who's got a higher end scanner, we probably can do heart rates of 90, 100 beats per minute, but somebody who's got a 64 slice scanner or a 128 slice scanner may not be able to scan patients who have a heart rate of more than 70 and a beta blocker may have to be used. Scan time is just few seconds to few minutes and it is easily done Claustrophobia is often not a problem. Any metallic implants is also not a contraindication. Arrhythmias can be a problem in lower end scanners. Radiation dose is overemphasized. Take my word for it. With higher end scanners, the radiation dose is very minimal and is unlikely to cause significant damage to patients. Now, while we talk about all of this, this is something which is happening in other parts of the world. This is a patient who you can see air, extensive air within the ventricle, right ventricle, and this is the right coronary artery. And then this is the contrast. This is essentially a post-mortem coronary CT angiography, which is being performed in a lot of other nations as part of the post-mortem examination, rather than cutting open the body and looking at the myocardium CT is able to analyze these patients and see is the cause of death is coronary artery disease or something else. <clears throat> Advances which are happening in the field of cardiac MR. So this is a patient uh, who's got an ectopia cardis. You can see very nicely CT depicts all the problems. Well, this is what is happening in cardiac MR where we are getting four dimensional images which are able to give us the quantification of flow, the anatomy, and the function in one go.